Okay, we'll be starting in another minute at 3 p.m. Eastern. And if you could go on mute, if you're not one of the presenters, I'd appreciate it. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much for joining. We are going to be recording this call. If you have any concerns about that, you can disconnect at this time. So it's 3 p.m. We have 77 people. We're expecting quite a few, but why don't we get started? Because we really appreciate those who were able to join already. So welcome everybody to the COVID Information Commons launch and demonstration webinar. We're delighted you could join us today. My name is Florence Hudson, and I'm the Executive Director for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub at Columbia University. And we're joined by many colleagues today, and especially um, the other Big Data Innovation Hub's Executive Directors. The COVID Information Commons, which you can find at covidinfocommons.net, as you can see on the first chart, serves as an open resource to explore NSF-funded research addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. It's brought to you by all the Big Data Innovation Hubs, all four of us, and you'll learn more about that from my colleague, Renata. And it's funded by the NSF Convergence Accelerator Program. And some of you may be familiar with the NSF Convergence Accelerator. It's a newer program that brings together multidisciplinary teams to address some of the societal and scientific challenges we have today. And COVID is a great example of that. So this is funded by NSF COVID Accelerator Award. It's a COVID rapid number 2028999. So this is our agenda today. First, we'll have a welcome by the Big Data Innovation Hubs, which will be done by my colleague, Renata um, rawlings Ghost from the South Big Data Hub at Georgia Tech. Then I'll be taking you through a COVID Information Commons overview and a deep dive demo. Then we're going to have lightning talks by two of our NSF COVID Rapid PIs or principal investigators. And we're delighted that we have two. I was hoping for two and we had 40 people offer. <laughs> so we are really very excited about the collaboration opportunity. And you'll be hearing more about how that inspired us to take this material and all of us and create a COVID Information Commons community with ongoing webinars. So this will be the first in the series. And then we'll talk about next steps. So what I'd like to do now is hand this off to Renata. And Renata, if you could say a little bit about yourself, and then if you could um, introduce the Big Data Hubs. Sure, thank you, Florence. Uh, so welcome everyone, welcome to this webinar. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the four Big Data regional innovation hubs. Um, the big data hubs are working together on this project, Florence being our fearless leader. And as you can see, a little bit about the hubs is that they were formed in 2015 by NSF as a network of four independent regional hubs um, that work for the nation as the Northeast, the Midwest, the South Regional Hub, which I'm the executive director for, uh, and the West Hub. And we have the executive directors from all four hubs here today. So Florence is for the Northeast. Uh, John, who is on the line too, who will be answering the questions here. Uh, Meredith Lee is the executive director for the West. And our overarching mission is to connect uh, sectors, which include industry, government, as well as academics, to data science and each other. Uh, to form innovation partnerships within and beyond our regions. So this project, the COVID Commons, is one of several joint efforts by the, by the four hubs to fulfill that mission and to connect researchers to who are working during this difficult time um, on COVID-19 uh, specifically and to be able to build a community around that, which is part of the main thrust of what the hub does. So I just wanted to welcome you today and also to encourage you to connect with your hubs. As you can see, uh, we're split up by the census. So the populations are the same, uh, even though the regions are bigger or smaller or different. And we're all very welcoming um, to how we have different programs and how you might be able to connect even further for collaborative purposes. So I wanted to thank you for joining today and turn it back over to Florence. Thank you, Renata, that was wonderful. I really appreciate it. And so as Renata said, we all have our regional focus because we're in different regions, uh, but we all hold hands, as I'd like to say, and work together. And so you could really reach out to any of us if you're not sure, and we'll get you connected. We do a lot of that. 
Um, and this is a great example of how we all work together because a lot of you already do. You know, you have co-PIs in different institutions around the country. And so we're delighted that we can enable more of that collaboration. So thank you, Renata, that was a great overview. So now let's get started uh, with the COVID Information Commons information. So first, a brief overview. The COVID Information Commons, as we mentioned, is funded by the NSF Convergence Accelerator Program, and it increases accessibility of valuable information regarding NSF COVID Rapid Research Awards. Rapid Awards are rapid response research projects. It's kind of like an embedded acronym. It also facilitates knowledge sharing and collaboration across COVID research efforts. And we'll show you how you can do that. Actually, today is a great example. We're all working together and we'll be able to collaborate. It also serves as a resource for researchers, students, and decision makers from academia, government, not-for-profit, and industry sectors to leverage research efforts and findings and accelerate the most promising research to mitigate the broad societal impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. It organizes relevant information in multiple ways, for instance, by research topic, by institution, by geography, and we'll show you examples of that during the webinar today. And in the future, it will allow research project teams to provide links to their data and present project information in ways relevant and user-friendly for users in academia, industry, government, and nonprofit sectors. As a matter of fact, the NSF COVID Rapid PIs have already been invited to submit a survey so that they could give us additional information and links to their, their data, their ORCID ID, their project pages, their GitHub repositories where they're putting the output of their COVID research. And we're looking forward in phase two to including that um, in the COVID information common system. We already have 160 that have responded. We will incorporate coronavirus related information as well in the future from NSF Open Knowledge Network projects, sometimes called OKNs, as well as some other NSF research projects over time. We're, we're um, evolving from our phase one into multiple phases of this project. So we're taking a phased approach to the implementation of the COVID information commons. Phase one, which launched on July 7th, 2020, is our MVP or minimum viable product launch. And that's what we have available today. And it took a team, it took a village, took many villages, um, and we're really delighted about it. We received the award in May, so we were very happy to be able to execute in less than two months to get this up and running. So providing the, M the MVP website allows us to search for USF, US NSF COVID Rapid Awards in particular. This first phase is really focused on COVID Rapid Awards. It includes two different search mechanisms and tools. One is a customized NSF simple search for COVID Rapid Awards by NSF Directorate, and we'll tell you more about that, and an advanced COVID research explorer with machine learning generated maps, which is a very powerful tool, a little more complicated to use. <laughs> so we're gonna take you through that. And we also have a user tutorial on the website that you can always look at eight or nine minutes with a live demo. It provides powerful query and visualization. You can search by keywords, topic, award type, institution, the size of the award, state, many things. And you can drill down by award in both tools. So you can see the title of, of the award, the abstract, the institution, the PI name and email address. And once again, the PI is the principal investigator and the co-principal investigators. And this is a great capability because then you can easily reach out to collaborate with them, as well as the state they're in, start and end dates, et cetera. Phase two will be available by October 2020. It could be that it comes out in phases, in steps, may have a step function in phase two. And actually one of our first steps is today. And we'll have the addition of the COVID PI provided links to award related information and collaboration opportunities. We plan to link to NSF Open Knowledge Network projects and other pertinent data sets. And there may be additional collaboration capabilities such as the Slack channel we're announcing today. In phase three, if there's a post award um, time frame, which we're hoping for, um, that the next stages of this would allow us to search for other pertinent award information and further potential innovations based on user and collaborator feedback. What's really important is that this is all user focused. So we really encourage you to tell us what you want, what would help you. So when you go to the website, um, covidinfocommons.net, 
for the COVID information comments and you go down to the bottom of the first page, there's a feedback form. And we really encourage you to use that and tell us what you would like to see for future phases of this tool. So when you go to the home page, you would see this at the beginning. And you can see that we have um, the about page, a user tutorial video on our project team. And then we have this Research Explorer tool, which is that very powerful tool I was mentioning to you. What you'll also see on the home page is the ability to search for NSF COVID Rapid Awards through the simple search. So you'll see uh, right here, it says, click these icons to find NSF COVID Rapid Grants by NSF Directorate. So the eight directorates are Biological Sciences, Computer and Information Science and Engineering, Education and Human Resources, Engineering, Geosciences, Mathematical and Physical Sciences, Social, Behavioral and Economic Sciences, and the Office of the Director. A number of PIs have already told me that they find this useful because they can easily go into the directorate that they usually work with or one they don't work with yet to see what type of awards are being granted. Also on the, the homepage, you'll see that we thank NSF and the Convergence Accelerator Program for the funding for this award. On every page, you'll also see that there's a contact us button. And when you send an email to info at covidinfocommons.net, it goes to all of the Big Data Hub directors that are with us today. So we all get to see it. So we can all see who's responding from our regions and across the United States. And today we're announcing our Slack channel. And so we added that last night. And Renata, I'm going to thank you for mentioning that idea <laughs> to, put it on, to put it on the website. And so it's covidcommons.slack.com. But if you click on this on the bottom of the home page or any of the, uh, the other pages as well, you can join the Slack channel. We'll take you right to it. So now let's get into what do you find when you get into the website. So you can go to the About tab. And you can either read the words, which are going to be similar to what I said to you today, or you can actually watch a video. If you're giving this URL to somebody else, you might want to suggest they watch the about page, you know, the about video on the about tab, because it'll give them this information in a, a nice digestible way. It's a three or four minute video. It has an overview and then it explains this phased approach that we just discussed. The user tutorial video tab has an eight or nine minute uh, video tutorial, including a live demo. It includes me taking you through the page with a live demo, through the website, through the different tools, through the NSF simple search icons, what you find in the abstracts, how you get there, and also this high-powered COVID Research Explorer ML map tool. It also shows me making little mistakes, so in case you make them, you don't feel bad, and it shows you how to get out of them and how to use Boolean algebra very well. So I really encourage you, if like you're trying to do something and you're not sure what to do, there's help within the tool, but you could also look at the user tutorial video that might help you. This is the COVID Information Commons project team. Our PI is Jeanette Wing at Columbia University. She's the director of the Data Science Institute. And then the four hub executive directors who you're meeting today, I'm Florence Hudson, you heard from Renata, Meredith Lee from the West Hub, and John McMullen from the Midwest Hub. Katie Nam is our operations manager at the Northeast Hub, and she's been very instrumental in getting this going. And Helen Yang is our rising junior student, who's actually one of our co-hosts today, and she's done a wonderful job helping us get this ready. And today on the webinar. We also had a lot of help from the Columbia University Information Technology team who put this whole website up with us. Um, we're very grateful for that. And then we have longitudinal support, which is very valuable. And the Columbia University Libraries team is helping us with our information science ideas. As we look at the information from the PIs as an example, how should we represent that? How should we connect to it? What do we do with their ORCID IDs? How do we make it ingestible and digestible for the units? So now, and so I really want to thank everybody. Everyone has been very pivotal in making this happen. So now let's jump in. So the first tool, which is a simpler one, I like to start with this one, is I'm looking for the uh, NSF COVID Rapid Grants by NSF Directorate by going into the NSF Simple Search Mechanism. So it's right here in the middle, as you can see. I'm going to be using pink on each of the pages to show you where I'm focusing. Let's look at the Office of the Director and see what type of awards are there. So we click on that, and you'll see over here on the left, it says the NSF organization you're in is the Office of the Director. The keywords are COVID and Rapid. 
So for those of you who love Boolean algebra, or might need to remember it like I did, um, whenever you're using these tools, you're gonna to be using capital A and D, capital OR, and standard Boolean capabilities. And here, I'll look at this. Here's a COVID Rapid Award. COVID Information Commons. That's the one that actually funded this project. Let's take a look at that. So we would click on that, and then we would come into a page where we'd see this entire abstract, actually vertically, and we put it next to each other so we can see all the words. But this would give you the award abstract number, the title, the type of award is, this is a rapid, um, the program manager at NSF that funded it, the start date, this was started on May 15th, the end date, October 31st. A lot of the rapid grants are a six month type of grant, that type of time frame. Awarded amount, the principal investigator, as well as the PI's email. If there were co-PIs, they would be listed here as well with their email addresses. The sponsor institution, the NSF programs, program reference and element codes, if you happen to know those, you don't have to. And then the abstract, which is, you know, what's the purpose of this? What are we looking to accomplish? What would the outcome be? And so that's available for all the hundreds of awards and actually the thousands of NSF awards, but the hundreds of COVID rapid awards. So that was a simple view of how you can leverage the NSF simple search. You can go into any of the, the buttons, biological, education, human resources. And I think this is very interesting too, to see the breadth of research. I was speaking on another webinar this morning, uh, Columbia University COVID Symposium. And so they're doing a lot in the health side and a lot of people from the medical school and from the, uh, the hospital, but we're, we're looking at how we can work more together. So now what we're gonna do is go into the COVID Research Explorer tool. So we click on this magic blue button, and this is what we come to. So here, what we see are these topographical maps. It's very interesting. So when you come in, you're gonna be on this little setting, which is map. This is the topographical map. You have this query over here, which I'll talk more about, which actually brings the data up. And when you look at this map, just like any good data scientist or scientist, when you look at something, it's what the data is telling you, what you see and what's not there. So in this case, let's say you're looking at the map and you say, wow, so this is, you know, if there's a lot of elevation, there are actually a lot of awards. Wow, social distancing is rather popular. I could click on this green one and then see the information over here. Then I might be looking around and say, okay, so novel coronavirus, of course, there'd be a lot of that. Wow, what don't I see here? Huh, what about mutation? What about virology? That's interesting. So what you would be able to do is go in and put that information over here and look to see what type of awards are there. This can be used by people at NSF as well or other you know, places where they're looking at where do we need to do more research and maybe perhaps making that decision or informing that decision. It could also be used by students. We think there's a great opportunity for students to use this database to learn more about the COVID research, to learn more about research in general, and perhaps even write papers about it. So that's something we're considering enabling in the future. But they can use the tool now. So this is the standard topographical map. Now what we can do is click on tree map, and oh my goodness, we get this kaleidoscope. And so this tree map actually clusters the awards. Um, it actually shows, I, I made it so that the size of the polygon is the amount of money, and I'll show you how to do that, the size, the size of the award itself. And it allows you to look at all these different elements. But you say, how can I actually walk my way through this in a good way? So let's look at this. So you can actually customize the view. And the way you would do that is there this little cog over here. It's like three little wheels together. And you would click on that and you get this drop down menu. It gives you a few different options. One is that you could look at a rectangular view of all of these awards which ends up looking like the periodic table of the elements, just so you know. The polygonal view I, I find more interesting, so I usually go with this one. And then here you can color by state and other options. I'll show you some of the other options. You can size by amount um, or some other areas. I like amount because I get to see who has how much money and I click on it and see for how long. You can label by institution, you can label by PI, and I'll show you some of those examples. And I like to highlight the same color. I know that one of the researchers that gave us some input on this said that she was able to rather quickly find other researchers in her state working on similar or complementary research, which is a great opportunity for convergence, right? And great opportunity for working in a multidisciplinary way. So this is what you would find if you were customizing it. 
um, by state and institution. So if you were to click on any of these little polygons, and you can make it bigger, you can zoom in when you're in the actual tool. Here, I actually clicked on one of the, icon, of the little polygons, and it was um, Cornell, which is in the state of New York. And because I said color by state and show similar by color, all these little green polygons are research awards from NSF in the state of New York. Very interesting. So if I were in New York, and I am, I could look to see who else is doing research there. You could do this by California. Here's a picture of California. You could do any state. These are just examples, one per region, so we're equitable. Here's North Carolina as an example. Here's Ohio as an example. Now let's say that you really want to zoom in and you say, well, you know, I'm in Pennsylvania. I want to know who else has awards in Pennsylvania. So you can go to the query over here on the left and you could make sure your parentheses are working well, the beginning and the end of the, the, prior, um, the prior words. And then you could put and, all capital Boolean, and state colon Pennsylvania. And then these are the awards in Pennsylvania. Very interesting. You could do that for any of the states. And so I click on one of them and then this is a rapid award the title is In-Home Automated and Non-Invasive Evaluation of COVID-19 Infection with Commodity Smartphones. This is the award number, 2029520. It was a $200,000 award, a number of the rapids were. It's at the University of Pittsburgh. Here are the email addresses for the PI and co-PIs. Here are their names. It's in the state of Pennsylvania. And here is a brief piece of the abstract, and I'll show you how to make that bigger. And if you were to scroll in a live demo or using it, you would be able to see all of these awards. So these are the awards in Pennsylvania, and that might be interesting. Here's a look at California. Once again, we clicked on one of these, and we see this one is a rapid on glycan um, core receptors for SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, and once again, $200,000. The award number, 2031989, UC San Diego. Um, the PI, PI's email address, California, and the abstract once again. And over here, we did that by saying, and state California. This, I think, would be fun for some students to play with and learn even more. And here is an example with Maryland, same idea, state Maryland. We click on one of them and find that. And here is Illinois. So let's say you're looking at this and you say, well, the institutions are interesting, but who are the PIs? Maybe I know some of these people. So you can go back into your little cogs, and then you could say, label by PI. And then it just magically changes, <laughs> literally, to the PI names. So you could say, oh, wow, James, yeah, I know what James is doing. Oh, Sonny, oh, wow, we were co-PIs together. Or we were, uh, we were postdocs together or something. And you can click on Sonny. And you can see where Sonny is. She's, uh, Sonny is at UC Irvine. And when you click on, on Sonny, you see, remember, the other PIs in that state, in the state of California. So if you are Sunny, <laughs> or you are Neil, or you are Andrew, or you're any of these, or Roxanne, you can click and see who the other PIs are in your state. And then you can go back and you can change it to institution if you want to see a little bit more by institution. You can also query by research topic. So here's an example of knowledge graphs. Here you would say, and knowledge, and graph. Remember, it's Boolean, so you have to be specific. And here you have, some of these are PIs and some of these are co-PIs, a list of PIs and co-PIs by state. So these people are in the same state. I wonder what institutions they're in, Let's see. Okay, so let me go back in to the COGS. I'm still on the tree map. I'm asking for a knowledge graph related research projects. I'm still coloring by state by, and the, the polygon is by amount, label by institution, Oh, so I see that, let me see, what did I have here? Yuri, oh, Yuri's at Stanford now. Okay, that's good to know. Oh, Ilya, Ilya's a co-PI, and he's at UCSD. Very interesting. And so this can quickly allow you to hone in by institution. It could be your prior institution, your current institution, another institution that you're looking to collaborate with, find the PI information. But once again, if you click on any of these, it will give you all that information over here based on how you, um, you specify your fields. So 
many people, when they start using this to make sure we have good data provenance, want to find themselves first <laughs> and make sure this is good data. And it is. It's the NSF award database on the back end. And so it's constantly being updated. But the real opportunity is to say, well, who don't I know yet? You know, who's doing research in my area? Who is doing research um, in a complementary area that I would like to talk to? Who's doing research at my institution I might not be aware of? And then you could go into a new topic. Here is and mutation as an example. I was talking to one of the PIs and he said, you know, I work in electrical engineering computer science. Um, my my rap is on mutation and using, you know, network theory on mutations. And I really could benefit from meeting bioinformatics experts and biology experts. And those aren't my peeps usually. You know, I don't usually, you know, work with them. I don't know where I should be publishing. I don't know what, you know, organizational events I should be considering. You know, what, what can I do? So we've been using this as a, a case to actually test how we can use the tool. So we put in mutation and mutation. And all of these institutions pop up, very interesting. And then over here, what you can do is you can click on this little fields area and change the information you see over here on the right for the abstract, the number of characters in the abstract, division names, directorate names, all sorts of things that you can look at. So here we see all these institutions. Hmm, what might I do? Well, you know, I went to Princeton, so I like to, I always like to see what they're up to. You know, you, you always like to look at all your alma maters and see what's going on there. So I click on Princeton, and oh, look at this, Vince Poor, Dean of the Engineering School. Ah, so he has this rapid award. He's working on mutations. But let's say I was Vince, he would say, wow, wow, there's someone at Rutgers. I wonder if I know who they are. So right up the block. So you can identify by geography, once again, they're in the same color. You could identify by topical area, you could identify by both, by state, by institution, and PIs. It's very interesting. And all of this is customizable. So to customize it further, you would go into this fields area on the top right, click on that. And then you could say, well, what do I want to show in this abstract area that I have over here? So this abstract area here, what would I want to show? Well, you want the title, I like to have the title of the award. The award ID so I can look it up on the simple search if I want to or find something else, you know, Google it for some other reason. The directorate and division you know, from NSF. Uh, the abstract, I'd like that to be the body. I want that to be all that content. I'd like to know how much money they got, what institution, the PI and their email address. Once again, if we really want to collaborate, that's very beneficial as we know, and the state. Another way that um, some people in government have mentioned to me is that perhaps their congressman or their governor <laughs> would like to know how much money or which institutions in their state um, actually have received these awards. And as we saw earlier, where you could click on one or in any of these, you can look actually by state by clicking on it and see what awards have been um, given out, uh, have been granted in that state in different uh, categories. So that's a quick overview of the COVID information comments. As I was mentioning, the user tutorial is on the website. So we're delighted to have you um, go in and, and look at that, to use it, give us your feedback on the form. Um, and the opportunity for the COVID information commons is not just to be a tool, a technology tool, but we really wanna leverage this to enable collaboration across the community. And so when we uh, were planning this webinar, we actually um, worked with NSF and we're very grateful um, for that um, in a number of ways. One is that the search tool actually, um, this Rapid Explorer tool was actually created by Paul Morris, who is at NSF, and I really wanna thank him for um, helping us leverage this incredibly powerful tool. But something else we're very grateful for is that a note was sent out to the COVID Rapid PIs, and we said, you know, please join us for the webinar, send us your, PIA, your information about your award. And then we said, if you'd like to do a five minute lightning talk on the webinar, let us know. Um, and we were hoping for two, we got 40. So that's why we're creating um, a COVID information commons community to enable this collaboration, which we're really delighted about. So we have two presenters today, two of the 40, some of the first to tell us they wanted to do this. And so first we're going to have Felicia Jefferson. And Felicia, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. How are you? Felicia, we're so delighted to have you. Oh, look at you. We're so delighted to have you with us today. So nice to meet you. Thank you. Felicia is at Fort Valley State University in Georgia, and she has a rapid uh, grant. And as you can see here, when we'll be posting these charts on the COVID Info Commons, um, we actually have hot linked all of their awards. Um, I'm not going to do that now because then I have to get back in. <laughs> but um, her award is on effects of the move to online teaching on the rural HBCU community due to the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. And as many of you should know, HBCUs are historically black colleges and universities. This is a very important topic. And after we have the next PI talk too, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how this really shows the range of the, of the awards and the research that's really critical in this area. So we really wanna thank Felicia for jumping in and right away telling us that she would like to do this. And so we have your charts in here, Felicia. So I'd like to um, hand it over to you and I'll project for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Florence. Thank you, Renata, because I know you're the South Sea Hub Director. So thank you for this invitation. Um, our project, Rapid Effects of the Moon to Move to Online Teaching on the Rural HVC Community Due to the Coronavirus COVID-19 Pandemic, was a huge collaborative effort. Uh, particularly the co-PI, Dr. Paul, she's doing most of the heavy lifting on this project as an online teaching expert who has decades of experience in that. Uh, we are both associate professors, Department of Biology, College of Arts and Sciences at Fort Valley State University. You could change the slide. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how this project came about. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Fort Valley State University, we are a land grant institution. We're one of only two in the state of Georgia, University of Georgia being the other. So we are part of the university system of Georgia. We have a huge college of agriculture, engineering, you know, everything you think about when you think about land grant institutions. And we are rural as many land grant institutions are. Uh, Florence said that we are an HBCU and we are a primarily undergraduate teaching institution. However, we do have graduate programs and we do have quite a bit of research capacity. A lot of research does go on at our institution. So I introduced you briefly to Dr. Jasmine Paul, but she again is doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, she has that uh, uh, online teaching expertise and she's one of the few who started early, early on, far in advance of the pandemic. I actually, before coming to academia, worked in industry for some time, actually on vaccine development and looking at G protein coupled receptors, you know, worked at pharmaceutical companies, you know, trying to find drugs and looking at drug delivery. So I did a lot of that, but you can see from the small slide that I have over here from my lab, um, we do a lot of other research, engineering, computer science, uh, neural technologies development. We do a lot of sleep research and you can see some of the students who, uh, they've gone to quite a number of conferences, Society for Neuroscience, Sleep, which was in Boston, uh, Gordon Research Conference on Sleep. We were scheduled to go to that this March in Italy, but of course that did not happen. Uh, so we were going to present there. But our project came about, Dr. Paul and I, we recently published a paper November of 2019 in Frontiers in Computer Science, looking at the differences between face-to-face -face and online teaching. And the citation is here in case you want to check it out. But what we found after years of online teaching, there really wasn't a vast difference in the outcomes when we look at variabilities, including differences for gender between online versus face-to-face -face teaching. However, with the pandemic, we did not see that. One of the major reasons that we hypothesized that that was, was because these are students who, when we looked at our study, those students chose to take online courses, right? Students who were forced to take courses online did not sign up to take courses online. So we knew that there would be some difference there. There would also be some differences in how faculty taught, but particularly for rural HBCUs, we noted that the availability of internet, not only for students, but for faculty was somewhat limited. Even being a land grant institution, 
and having all of you know USDA, lots of lots of funding, it it just is not available in certain areas. So we knew that that would affect performance. We wanted to look at that and see if this was standard across rural HBCUs. We also wanted to look at our particular student population because the on-campus experience, particularly for African-American students, tends to be more like family from previous research that we've done. And you know, if you go look at our grant, you can see more information there in the abstract, but it's a different experience. And then you're in a rural area lacking online technology sometimes, the internet. And so we wanted to see what those effects were. So if you turn to the next slide, please, Florence. Yes, ma'am. We sent out a number of surveys, not only to re rural institutions, but also to other institutions nearby. Okay, because if you notice, we've got a list here, some of the institutions that we're working with. The majority are HBCUs, but you'll see in there, Louisiana State University, University of Texas at Arlington. Okay, there are a lot of other universities that we're looking at too for comparative analysis. And we're trying to see what the experiences are there. We're also looking at urban HBCUs, obviously some urban institutions. And we wanna see how these differences, if there are, and we, we have some preliminary data that shows that there are, uh, you know, what these are like. But we are also trying to recruit additional people to participate. We've been surveying faculty, students, graduate teaching assistants, postdocs who teach classes, um, any of those group populations, we have different surveys for all of these groups. And we really wanna make this an even more collaborative effort to get as much information and as much data back as we can to make this a excellent project, the results should be great. And I would definitely, making sure, looking at my time, couldn't do this without, uh, couldn't do this without a number of people. Dr. Eric Jones, who I know he also has a, another grant. He has an eager COVID-19 at University of Texas Arlington. Um, and just so many people at our institution that are helping out with this project. Online teaching resources, our stats people, Office of Institutional Development, they're all assisting with this. And I wanna thank those people, but if you have any questions for me, please feel free to ask. And I'm sure Dr. Paul's on the call too. If you're interested, you can email her, paulj at fbsu.edu. Thank you. Alicia, this was wonderful. And I wanna tell you how excited I was when I saw this chart. And I said, look at all these collaborators. Yes, leading by example. <laughs> you know, this is just so wonderful. And this is exactly what we're aiming for. You know, how we can work together for everyone to move forward. You know, it's just so wonderful. And then sharing the information openly, that's really the culture of this whole project. So we're, we're so delighted you shared this with us. This has been wonderful. Thank, and you. thank you for inviting me. Oh, of course, our pleasure. We're so glad it worked out. And so now I'd like to introduce Peter. Peter's on the phone. Uh, Peter Rose is from um, the University of California in San Diego, someplace that's always beautiful if you haven't been there. The weather is always perfect. Why would anyone ever leave? So um, that's where he's from, and uh, Peter is the PI, Ilya Zaslavsky is the co-PI for this really cool project. And now you're going to see the range of what we really have to think about regarding COVID-19 and all the implications to the humans, to society, to technology, to healthcare, to keeping people alive. So, um, and how we leverage data and different systems and technology to get there, as well as social behaviors. So and now Peter is going to give us his presentation. I'd like to hand it over to him. And then after that, we're going to get into a few more interesting topics. Peter? Okay, thank you, Florence, for, for inviting us. So let me tell you a little bit about the background of COVID-19 net. So we were part of the NSF Open Knowledge Network program. And in particular, we were interested in linking three types of data, biomedical data, environmental data, and sociodemographic data. So then in January, COVID came along. We thought this is really a great use case where we need to integrate multidisciplinary data. So if we can go to the next slide, that shows you what we're trying to accomplish. So if you think about COVID, there are really 
three major areas. One is the host, which can be it's human, can be animals and so on. Then we have the pathogen, the virus, and then everything else, which we call the environment. So we want to be able, we want to enable researchers basically to look at this interplay between those different areas. So for example, looking at host pathogen interaction, how does the environment affect, you know, uh, infections and, 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 and so forth. So that, that basically was the background. And we started, we can next slide please. So when we applied for this rapid grant, we, we had collaborators on the open knowledge uh, uh, network from the NSF. We had collaborators from UC Santa Barbara, it's in green, UCSF in orange and us in blue. And we kind of divided up in particular areas. So we are focusing on, on the blue areas like population characteristics, health data, pathogen information, environmental information, whereas our collaborators from UC Santa Barbara, this is another rapid, focuses on transportation and supply chain, and as well as UCSF focuses on, on biomedicine. Um, next slide, please. So this is a kind of our prototype knowledge graph. So in a knowledge graph, you don't have information silos, but you link all the data together. So this is just you know, a prototype. We don't have much information in here yet. So on the right-hand side, you see information about the pathogen, the host. We have information about the epidemiology, about the, uh, this outbreak here. Mm -hmm. Then we focused a lot on the biomedical area. So we have more than 30,000 different strains in this knowledge graph, but it's all linked together. For each strain, we know all its variants or mutations the effect on the genes, proteins. We know about protein-protein interactions. We link this together with publications. And then most importantly, we also link this to geolocation. We mapped out the entire geographic hierarchy of the world so we can map strains or cases to any location in, in, in the world all the way down to the census track level. Um, okay, next slide, please. So when we start this project, we wanted to be, this to be an automated project and that can be expanded by others. So we have a very transparent and reproducible workflow. So first of all, we start off with open access data. So we want to be able to redistribute the information. So we start with trustworthy public data repositories and then we created a process that automatically extracts information and integrates that information. That's really the key, the integration of all this information. We spend a lot of, this is where most of the work goes. And with COVID, things change on a daily basis. So we actually have a daily update process. We have open source software that is in, and on a daily basis, we update information, integrate information, and then upload that into a knowledge graph that then can be queried next. So we try to you know, follow the FAIR principles and everything is open, easily accessible. You can get to all our software, it's reusable and, and, and so forth. So with that, maybe going to our next slide. So you know, once we create this knowledge uh, graph, there are a few things we can, or the end user can do. First of all, you can query and, and browse the knowledge graph, find information. Um, so what's shown here on, on the top left, this is exploring protein-protein interaction between virus proteins and, and human proteins, for example. Then since it's in a graph form, you can interactively actually explore this. So in green are various strains of the virus in the particular geolocation. You can look at specific mutations, see how they're being shared among different strains, for example. So this is more an interactive analysis to you know, an exploratory analysis, but if you wanna do a more quantitative in-depth analysis, you can also access all that data easily in, in computational notebooks, such as RStudio or, or, or Jupyter notebooks for a more reproducible type of analysis. And as I mentioned, you know, mapping onto geolocation is obviously very important for COVID. So we also, access this information through dashboards so up on top right. We show, for example, San Diego County current cases or predicted case counts. In the center here, we focus in on specific cities and look at, for example, various pre-existing conditions in those areas, like you know, what's the prevalence of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and, and, and so forth, and how does it affect you know, um, the population at risk. And we can drill down further using the SWARF tool. We can drill down, for example, all the way to the census track level and, and look in, in more depth you know, at, at health uh, populations at risk and, and age structure and, and, and so forth. So 
we want to thank your next slide please we want to thank the nsf for funding and also the the uh, open knowledge network program we were part of and the collaborators there and obviously we're also looking for collaborators so we're looking for a number of collaborators so if you have open data sets you want to share with us we like to discuss them we like to integrate them if you have code that extracts data from various data sources, that will be of interest to us and obviously if you want to use any of our data and i think there are, we already talked to a number of people in this program um you know we want to hear from you too and and i think that's that's about it and so in the chat window i'll i'll paste um, a link to our COVID graph. So it's all available online so you can um, explore that yourself. Thank you. That's wonderful, Peter. Thank you so much. So I love the way these two projects show the range of what has to be done and the range of opportunity to collaborate. And they're both already collaborating across different states, across different institutions, um, and there's really a lot to do. So think about how you can collaborate, who you would love to connect with, and our Slack channel will help you with that, um, going directly to the you know, PI in the abstract through either of the tools to their email. And in this case, being able to go directly to Felicia and Peter because they were gracious um, in presenting today. So thank you very much, Peter. Okay, now what I'd like to do is I want to publicly thank all of the PIs who offer to present um, Peter could tell you, I was talking to him like a week ago saying, you know, I don't know if anyone's going to want to present on this, you know, could you present, <laughs> you know, he's like, okay. And then 40 humans later, <laughs> we have all these people who want to, which we're really delighted about. And so I really want to thank them publicly. And as I mentioned, this has really inspired us to create an ongoing COVID Information Commons community. So uh, these charts will be um, on the COVID information, connected from the COVID Information Commons website. Um, we also plan on posting the recording as well. We'll probably upload it to YouTube. We've done that. Actually, the videos that are in there were posted, I think, by Helen, um, our rising junior student on YouTube. And so um, these charts will be available. And as I mentioned, they're all hot linked to their award. Um, or you could, you know, obviously go into the simple search. So you can see here we have, you know, um, from people from Vanderbilt, George Washington, University of West Florida, uh, DSRI, Tennessee, Maryland, Chicago, NYU, uh, such a range in a lot of different areas. Um, UT Austin, UMBC, West Virginia, Princeton, Credential Engine, um, Portland State, UW-Madison, Michigan, ASU, NEXI, Penn State, um, and the list goes on. Another from UCSD, UT Dallas, Northeastern, UCSD again, Laredo College, Morgan State, uh, Rice University of Missouri um, in Columbia, and uh, uh, UC Riverside, Albany, Idaho, NYU again, USC, Louisiana State, UC Santa Barbara, Florida State, and Purdue. And these are the ones we heard from so far. And so what we're planning to do is look at this corpus and then decide how best to organize it. Um, you know, we'll see how many researchers in like a one hour webinar, we're so zoomed out, we're a little conscious about not making these too long. Um, you know, how many we could have and maybe have them around certain categories. So people who are interested in that topic can come and listen to a fair amount of research. And then also the researchers can collaborate and learn from each other and then perhaps choose to collaborate even more. So that's part of our next steps, which we really weren't planning until we got all of this wonderful input. And we're really grateful for that. So that's what we're going to do. So Peter talked a little bit about fair principles. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but just to review. Fair principles are regarding making sure that data is findable for F, accessible for A, interoperable for I, and reusable for R. So the COVID Information Commons actually is built on these principles as well. So through this, this tool and these two tools, you can find all NSF Rapid Awards related to COVID easily in context. Um, it's all accessible. You get access to all the public award information plus PI information so you can reach out further. As I mentioned in phase two, which will be ready by October um, of 2020, 
we will figure out how to incorporate links to the PI data, the PI provided data um, with their project websites, as Peter graciously put in the chat already. And, you know, some of them are putting their things in GitHub and other things that could um, occur. Um, from the interoperable perspective, we're starting with interoperable humans <laughs> and researcher collaboration. And perhaps, you know, as we work with OKNs, open knowledge networks, you know, like Peter and Ilya's, then we could um, look at how these data sets are, you know, uh, collaborative too, and he already is doing that. So is there something we can do in a broader way together and reusable? The information you get from the COVID Info Commons, whether it's the NSF Simple Search that you go through or the, um, the, the Explorer tool, you can download in Excel spreadsheets or CSV files, and so you can reuse the data. You can take download a, a, a JPEG or something of the diagrams that you create. So there are a lot of ways to reuse the data and share it with others. So our next steps, um, so please watch the, the tutorial video um, when you go in and you'd like to get a little more information about how to maneuver your way through it on the COVID Information Commons website, covidinfocommons.net. Use it, share it, provide feedback and input for future phases. Um, I've already seen there were some things in the I'm not looking at the chat. I really want to thank John McMullen and Meredith Lee, our executive directors from the Midwest and the West Hub. West Hub. They're doing a great job of keeping up on the chats. And they were mentioning on our Slack channel that um, some people are already asking, you know, will we have access to the charts? Will we have access to the video? And that's, that's all going to be posted. Um, but we do want your input. And some people have been asking, like, what about international collaborators? Tell us what you want. Because uh, the commitment we've made is we want to listen to the users. And we want to ask you, what would make this even more valuable to you? So please send that in the feedback form or send us an email to info at covidinfocommons.net. Either way, uh, you can join the Slack channel. There's a bit.ly, 2 capital W little K 416 capital B or it's on the, uh, the COVID Information Commons website. If you go there, actually somebody went into that to ask for the charts I just saw because I've been presenting. Um, so um, you can go into the Slack channel. Um, you can sign up for the COVID Information Com uh, Commons community and uh, follow up the KIC events. Um, offer to present a lightning talk at future webinars. We're happy to take as many as you want. And it could be, we'll see how this evolves. You know, let's say we do these, you know, these webinars. We have the PIs and co-PIs presenting. Some research uh, assistants are going to present too. Give them the opportunity to present. I've already had some requests for that. And then maybe we'll decide that the next one will be a more collaborative discussion. Maybe it'll be a brainstorming discussion. We can decide together and we're here to help you. You know, as Renata said, you know, we're collaboration hubs, we're catalysts, we're community conveners. So we'll do what helps you do great things with your research. Um, if you're interested, you could also um, ask to join the COVID Info Commons community uh, proposal that we plan on creating rather quickly. <laughs> it's 2 July 20th for the International Fair Convergence Symposium organized by CoData and GoFair. It's in Paris in October. Um, I'm not going to Paris. It'll be virtual for me. Um, and even if I, I don't know if they'd let me in right now. I don't think they will. So um, if you're interested in that, um, they actually have a track on crisis reduction and response, learning from the COVID-19 outbreak, including data sharing. So email us by July 17th, uh, which would be this Friday, if you're interested in participating in the proposal. Um, I'm currently thinking, you know, we would present the COVID info commons, and then a number of PIs like this would be doing lightning talks about their research. And it'll be an international community, which would be a great opportunity um, to create more collaborations. Also, we'd like you to save the date. Um, October 14th to the 16th is the Academic Data Science Alliance annual meeting. Um, and Meredith, do you want to go off mute and say a couple words about this? I know you've been rather involved with them. Sure. Thanks, Florence. Actually, Sarah Stone, Renata, uh, and I are all on the committee for the ADSA uh, summit. And this year, there's a joint session between the ADSA annual meeting and the Data Science Leadership Summit. Uh, it'll be completely virtual online, and there's a July 20th deadline for any ideas for talks or broader sessions. So we would love to see the work from this community uh, featured there, particularly with the focus on rapid response. Wonderful, thank you, Meredith. And Meredith is the executive director for the West Peak Data Hub and her two co-EDs, Sarah Stone um, up at the University of Washington and Christine Kirkpatrick um, down at the University uh, UCSD, again, SDSC, San Diego Supercomputer Center. 
So thank you for explaining that, Meredith. We really appreciate it. So you can see both of them are due July 20th. <laughs> so you just have to let us, you have to let me know by the 17th, but I'll put it together for the family um, for the one that's related to Paris. And for any of the above or questions, just email us at info at covidinfocommons.net. The four of us see it. Uh, John, we probably should just have you say hi if there's anything else you have to add. Is there anything you wanted to add to the next steps or some of the other topics that we discussed today? Okay. So now we're going to the Q&A. Here are our email addresses. I'm Florence. You heard from Renata. You just heard from Meredith. And John's picture's there too um, on, the, uh, on the webinar. And so email us. Um, go to our websites. Uh, we all each have COVID information there as well. We've been focused on this for a number of months together. And now we'd like to take any additional questions and answers. I'm going to stop uh, screen sharing. These charts will be made available on the COVID Info Commons website. And uh, we do plan to make the recording of this webinar available as well. Okay, great. Do we have any other questions? Wow, we have 124 people and we ended early. We, that really happened. That's pretty cool. Can you speak to what those infographs were developed in? Oh, the ones that I presented, Alex? It was Lingo 4G Explorer, the topic heat map. Yeah, that was in Lingo 4G Explorer. It's a tool that um, is actually going against the, um, the NSF um, data, award database um, focused on the COVID rapid awards. Could someone briefly summarize what the NSF Big Data Hubs are doing beyond the COVID-19 comments? That's a great question, John. Who would like to take that? I've been talking the whole time, so I think one of you others should do it. Renata? A quick uh, introduction. So the Big Data Hubs, as you said, were collaboration engines. So we each have own, our own programs that are unique to our regions because we wanted to focus on, we have priority areas that are in the region. For instance, you know, the South, we actually have um, uh, focuses on uh, HPCUs. We have 80% 80, 80 of them in the southern region and also on um, flooding. The west has water in a different way, water drought. The Midwest uh, had digital agriculture. And so you can see, but we do have some things in common, which are a focus on connection and a focus on um, connecting data scientists and different sectors. Also, um, a focus on data science education. I think that crosses all of the areas as well. So you could go to each of our websites, but we also, uh, for our specific programs, but then jointly, we have uh, the COVID Info Commons. We jointly also, just a few months ago, ran the HDR, the Harnessing the Data Revolution um, PI meetings and different convenings. Now a lot of those convenings are virtual, so they're a lot more cross-regional than they were before. So I would check out each of the hubs um, and, and see how you could fit either in our party areas or in our region. Anyone else? Meredith or John? Or? Well, I'll put a little bit more. I've been talking a lot, but we each have certain focus areas based on some of the regional needs we have. Health is actually in the Northeast Hub, one of the areas that we have, and this is directly in there. Probably you're aware what New York is. So it's been, um, been interesting um, and we knew we had to focus on it. So health is one of our big areas. We have an exposed zone database project that we're working on which relates to the COVID data as well. Um, we also are building our urban to rural communities area um, and looking at hydrology and some other areas and we each have a different piece of that across, across the country and are gonna hold hands more over that. We have education data literacy, um, there's a data science, uh, you know, big data for little kids program, cutest name, um, other things that, you know, go up and down. And then we also have a responsible data science area, including security, privacy, and ethics. And that has gone in a couple of different directions in the Northeast. We're going to be partnering with a working group I chair at IEEE um, with 250 people in it on clinical Internet of Things, data and device interoperability with TIPS, which is Trust, Identity, Privacy, Protection, Safety, and Security. We're going to be doing a joint workshop with them. 
um, to further this whole area of responsible data science. So we each have different things we're doing. Our websites have our projects on them. If you go to the Northeast Big Data Hub, look at the focus areas, and it lists all our projects under those. And so we each have different ones. So I'd encourage you, where you live, you may as well start, you know, at home, you know, look at your local, at your local hub. And then as Renata was saying, you know, we're connecting more to each other and we're always happy to connect you um, as appropriate. So hopefully that was helpful. That was a really good question, John. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. If you start out with your home hub, we'll connect you to all of the things, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, question here. Are these universities deciding on how to phase back into going back to school? What data are they relying on going back to making this decision? Is there anybody involved in that regarding the data that's being used about um, restarting school and going back? Angelique, did you raise your hand? You're on mute. <laughs> I am on mute. Yes. Uh, well, so I'm on the COVID task force for uh, uh, for CUNY. Oh. And so we are just basically reviewing. So when I say we are, I am uh, <laughs> reviewing the data uh, uh, pretty much uh, daily uh, on, you know, uh, space, HVAC, um, mm. spread, um, young adults, etc., etc., and we're basically basing our decision on those data. But the data I just gathered from open access, and I just built my own little uh, little datascape uh, uh, program. Uh, to just suck the data out of the um, preprint and out of uh, the database, the uh, available databases. So it'll be really a lot easier for me to have the COVID data commons to to navigate than you know reinventing the wheel by myself. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you for your very collaborative approach to everyone is being that way. Actually, Tracy Van Holt, who's down the block from you at Stern. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she put in the chat, does anybody know if there's a source of information on the closing down and opening up of phases at the state and sub-state level? I don't know of a comprehensive source. Do any of you know of a comp? And I, I, the data is so fresh. You know, it's happening every day. But people are making yeah. decisions and remaking them. Go ahead, Mary. Um, I just posted a link that was very recently announced, um, broken down by state. This is uh, John Hopkins, and it at least started out with, I believe, uh, public schools and like K through 12, but it may have expanded. It's uh, changing every day. So that's one example of, you know, an approach in trying to do um, state by state comparisons. And it would be really interesting to compare notes from other folks. I know a lot of us are trying to help out where we can with our individual uh, institutions and, and regions and sharing that along the way is, is super helpful. Wonderful. And I realize it's 402. So I'd like to say this was only scheduled to go to four o'clock. If people want to stay on for q and I'm happy to stay and if the EDs can join me, but you don't have to. If you can't, my calendar is available. Um, but for those of you who did join, we're delighted you joined us. Um, we look forward to continuing our collaboration. We'll be in touch on the following webinars. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers, to the executive directors, my, my trusted teammates, um, and the PIs who spoke. Um, but feel free to stay on and we'll continue to answer questions. Also, some people are adding links to the chat. If you do know of more information, feel free to add it and we can add it to our websites or our distributions. Another question was, what if my word does not show up where I think it should? Um, send an email um, and we'll see what we can do about it. <laughs> Read it and create the tool, um, but we can you know, try to help. So. Um, I think there was um, someone who asked that. So please, um, please just email us at info at covidinfocommons.net. I think that was Deborah who asked that. Oh yeah, they already told you that. Okay, Meredith and John are trusty chat keepers. Um, anything else here that we didn't answer yet, do you think? 
Um, there was a question to NSF and a couple others. Uh, as more people get engaged in the chat, it's hard to follow the stream. And so we definitely will save this and try to open these up as threads um, for posterity and, and answering on Slack. Um, so are you looking at the one John said was um, NSF and other agencies have had success with IDEA Labs? online meetings of diverse researchers to advance defining and addressing complex science and societal problems. Might NSF have any plans for an idea lab on COVID-19? I don't know the answer to that question. Is there anybody who wants to answer that? If not, we can uh, follow up afterward. And we'll see. We don't have plans for a COVID ideas lab, but we just uh, participated in running an ideas lab for uh, ideas lab type virtual meeting uh, for the harnessing data revolution. And so these have been very helpful as you as this person, as you said, that they have been uh, great sources for collaboration. So that's something that we could always bring up or try and surface in the chat as Swarns was saying, but um, that may be an opportunity, you know, particularly if there are more phases to this uh, going forward. So just yeah. acknowledging the comment and that we can follow up. Thank you very much, yes. And um, you know, we have it in the chat here, but if you'd like to make sure we really heard you, you could send us an email as well, <laughs> as Renata was saying, um, because um, we do want to take all of the user input, as we said, and, and plan what the next potential steps could be to make sure they're helping you do what you're trying to do. So thank you very much for bringing that up. And it's a great idea. The more we collaborate, the better, even though we get zoomed out. I think that's it. I'm just trying to read here and I don't love the Slack channel. Oh, good. Yeah, that's me. That's Deb Paul. Thank you oh, for the Deb Slack channel. Made it. Hey, thank you. Sorry. I was, I was, uh, I was showing my screen. I didn't see it for a while. Yes, may, may I also share? So I'm, I'm uh, lucky enough and excited to be a co-PI on one of the projects that got funded. Um, and I'd also uh, was very excited to be able to be part of a task force here in the U.S. and one in the EU. And we are going to have an event on Friday morning, Friday morning, Eastern Daylight Time, Friday morning, 8, 8 a.m. Eastern Daylight, um, that talks about what we've been able to do as part of the Central European Taxonomic Facility and the Distributed System of Scientific Collections Network in the EU, uh, put together a task force on COVID-19 to figure out what we could do uh, in a matter of like 12 weeks. And so this event on Friday morning is going to be sort of what did we manage to do in terms of data mobilization, data linking, semantic data enhancement, um, all, all around the subject of COVID-19 and focus on collections and taxonomy. Um, so I don't know how many people here, if that maybe overlaps with your world, um, but you could come see the tools that were employed to build some of the resources that we've managed together. Thank you. Did you actually put that in the chat? How to I tried, but I just see that that Twitter link doesn't doesn't seem to be working, does it? That's, That's weird. For me. It did work? Oh, good. It works for me, too. Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. Yep. Is that the TAF? C that is. That's Task Force TAF. Yeah, T is so COVID. Oh, they use the little a. Okay. Mm. Yep, it does work. Yay. Okay, great. Feel free to put it in the Slack channel, too, as people start you know, okay. join. We'll do that. So I think our group too, I mean, I'm, I don't know, I was hearing kind of the connections conversation going on here. Certainly in our group, in our small group that involves sort of virologists, some disease ecologists, some mammologists, and some collections people, along with some software developers, certainly was the, um, this cross collaboration across disciplines that you wouldn't necessarily normally sit at the same table with. Mm -hmm. and how both sort of invigorating and illuminating it was mm -hmm. for people. Um, yes, there were COVID ontologies. Hmm. There'll certainly be people in this group who are interested in ontologies for things like host pathogen, host parasite, host species association data um, in this particular group anyway. 
Well, I think so. You know, when I think each of us are collaborating with others, we're each like our own little octopus, I think, you know, and so like the group I was talking to today, they work with NIH a lot, um, a lot of medical doctors. Um, and so we talked about further collaboration. They actually, I presented the COVID info comments to them and they said, how do I put in virology? <laughs> you know, I want to see when the NSF awards is working on that. So um, I think there are a number of people, probably almost anything you could ask, there's probably someone in this community that's doing something with it or knows someone who does. So these are all great questions. It looks like I know we're um, a little after time, but there's an education uh, through the Hubbard Study Education Workforce uh, Working Group. Uh, where people who are doing work um, that is specifically is going to turn out education and workforce opportunities in this, not just the COVID space, but uh, for data science in general, but particularly right now on three topics are focused on how to teach project-based courses, like if you have examples of that that you're doing, um, uh, and particularly with COVID projects, that would be very interesting. Um, any work on evaluation of education programs or workforce programs that you've implemented uh, in this time frame is also something of interest. And the third one is just highlighting projects, education projects. So there's a, I'll put a link in the chat. Uh, you can sign up to be a speaker. We're putting together the, the schedule for the next year. Um, and that will start in September. The first Friday in September at 11 o'clock will be the first one. And so um, just encourage people to, to sign up if that is your part of your space. Excellent, thank you, Renata. All this specific detail is very helpful. One question I, I just got uh, privately was about the Slack channel. So in the Slack, um, from the 160 PI surveys we got back, we asked the, the COVID rapid PIs how they would describe keywords rather than using the clustering tool we have in case we I worked on machine learning for a long time. I worked on the Watson strategy at IBM in my past. And so based on um, patterns and the keywords, I created about 15 different you know, hashtag areas in the Slack channel, but we can add more. And I'm not sure if you all are gonna be able to, if you're not, you know, email us or message me in the Slack and we can create it. Um, I'm learning more as we go. We were concerned there could be too many people and someone told me there are 15,000 people in the Drupal Slack channel, so we figured there'd be plenty of room. Um, but now we have to decide how to organize it to best suit you. And as we move forward, if there are some of the channels we created that are empty, we can get rid of those um, and put better ones in. So please do let us know what's most helpful for you if you can't do it yourself. Okay, great. So I think we've depleted um, the questions. And I want to thank you all for joining. This is a very exciting endeavor, and we're delighted with all the incredible work you're all doing. I want to thank all my buddies, my partners, and colleagues, and we'll be posting this, as we said. And we look forward to seeing you on the next session. Anything else before we close? Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And thank you to NSF for this great opportunity for all of us. Bye-bye. Be well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for an informative session. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for the information.